Good morning and thank you so much for joining me for this Thursday edition of Home of the World's Worst Weather Live. My name is Ian Bailey. I'm a meteorologist and education specialist, part of a crew of six meteorologists who work here on the summit taking out the weather observations, putting out forecast products, and doing research from the top of New England. Um, so today I'm connecting with you guys to go ahead and do a recap of what's going on with our current summit conditions. We're going to talk about the forecast a little bit because it is going to be a pretty interesting couple of days going forward. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time to go back and answer your guys' questions at the end. So if you have any questions throughout the program, make sure you ask. Uh, and I promise we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, by the time we're done with the broadcast today. So let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about some of the current summit conditions here. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in so you can see on our current summit conditions page what's going on. So... Outside, we have pretty average wind speeds right now, about 32 miles per hour for our wind speed. Um, so that's pretty typical throughout most of the year. Um, but we are expecting our wind speeds to ramp up over the next 24 to 48 hours. And they actually have gone up a little bit even since this morning. So we'll be watching to see at some point uh, headed into tomorrow, we'll be seeing hurricane force winds here on the summit once again. Very typical winter conditions for this time of year. Temperatures hanging out in the mid-20s, so we're hanging out at 24 degrees right now, and that has been kind of hanging out through most of the morning. Uh, we are expecting temperatures to drop inevitably. We do have a cold front that will start to work its way through, uh, at which point we'll see that go back below 20 degrees, back down into the teens. Um, so we'll be paying really close attention to that. Also, we have snow showers. Snow showers had just started, like from the last observation I took at the top of the hour, uh, and we are expecting pretty heavy snow for the next 48 hours. So this is it. This is the beginning of it going forward. So starting off light, but we're expecting some pretty heavy precipitation with this storm that is moving in. We also have freezing fog, so we are in the clouds up here with temperatures below freezing, and so we are expecting um, some icing conditions as well. Nothing like what Tom and Ryan saw over the last shift, but we are seeing some icing conditions on the tower currently and some blowing snow as well with our wind speeds. And so this is all pretty typical winter conditions for us, um, but it is the beginning of the storm that is to come over the next 48 hours. So let's take a look at our visibility. It is really bad. Uh, so our visibility is only about 1 16th of a mile right now thanks to that fog. We can only see maybe about 50 feet across the observation deck, so you really can't see terribly far. And then if we're taking a look at our vertical temperature profile, again, this is coming from our mesonet, a series of weather stations across from the top of the mountain all the way back down to the base, monitoring things like temperature and wind. And we can see a pretty interesting profile. It's pretty normal. Temperatures are decreasing as you go up towards the summit. Um, but the entire lower half of the mountain is actually above freezing. So any precipitation that's falling down there right now might be like a wintry mix of a precipitation. Or if you're really down at the base, you might even be seeing rain at this point. But up here at the summit, we are well below freezing at our 24 degree mark there. Um, and so that is, you know, we're seeing snow. We're expecting to see snow throughout most of this period. And we don't really expect our temperatures to get upwards of freezing like it has the last couple of shifts that we've been up here. So again, we are expecting a pretty considerable amount of snow as this system starts to move in. So that's a look at some of our current summit conditions and what's happening up here presently. Let's go ahead and check out the sunrise picture this morning. Normally I like to show you guys the observation deck, but it's still it's still encased in ice, believe it or not. There is still a solid at least foot block of ice that is blocking that camera's view down onto the observation deck. So instead, let's take a look at what it looked like this morning. Uh, if I can get my camera to behave properly. There we go. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take a look at what it looked like this morning uh, when we had our sunrise. And it's been interesting to watch the clouds kind of come and sit down on top of us. Um, so I'll try to pause the video at a particular point, but this is just before sunrise this morning, right after around 6 o'clock. I'll go ahead and start the video here. You can see clouds just kind of briefly zip up over the summit there. And bam, right there. So let me go ahead and zoom in so you guys can see really well. So right here is what we call a Peleus cloud, or what you might know as a cap cloud. Um, you can kind of see it forms like a little lid right over the top of the mountain. There's even one forming right at the summit level. So when I woke up this morning and started my shift today, this is what I was coding. This is what I was seeing outside. So it was literally a little dome, a little cloud that was sitting right over top of the mountain. Uh, and as the rest of the morning progressed, if I play the rest of this video here, you can see inevitably it did kind of just lower right down on top of us. And we've been seeing pretty much fog all the way up until present. And so that's what it's been. You know, and it's interesting. We have overcast clouds above. We have this nice line of clouds right at summit level from the moisture that's condensing right here at 6288. So, yeah, it's been a pretty interesting morning so far, but we are very much in the fog at this point um, with our low visibility, and that's likely to persist at least for the next 48 hours while we're taking a look at this storm. So let's do that. Let's take a look on the synoptic scale, because remember, this is the synoptic, the big picture scale. This is the large national look at all the different things that are going on. 
And in particular, I wanted to start off with satellite so you guys can get an idea of what a satellite image looks like. So this is an infrared satellite image. So this is actually looking at heat. This is looking at temperature. It might look like a radar image where you might be seeing like this is all rain and moisture, but it's actually just temperature. So the brighter colors you're seeing are taller, colder, more well-developed cloud tops. Um, and with that, we can actually see really easily where different low pressure systems are. We talked a little bit about low pressure last time I was with you guys. And the main things that we're looking for with low pressure is counterclockwise rotation, pretty significant cloud formation, uh, and usually it has this kind of comma shape to it. So let's see if we can figure out where on the map that might be occurring. So immediately, I'm looking right here, and I see the rotation right around this part. So let me go ahead and zoom in so you guys can see that rotation a little bit better. There we go. So you can see the clouds are rotating counterclockwise right through here. And if I get rid of this, the cloud structure itself actually does have a bit of a comma shape to it. Uh, and so this is actually the main low pressure that we're paying attention to. Um, but there's also a secondary low pressure right down here. Um, so I can zoom over a little bit um, with a little bit of rotation right around this section here. Um, and so we can actually are going to watch the merging of these two low pressure systems into one really large powerful system over the northeast um, that's going to be responsible for all the snow and all the other conditions that we're going to be seeing uh, over the next 48 hours. And if we're taking a look at other parts of the country, things are relatively quiet. Uh, we do have this low pressure that's been a, a point of interest for meteorologists on the western part of the country for at least a week now because it's just sitting here and rotating. It's still technically a, ro a low pressure, but it's not moving anywhere. Um, it's been stationary over Nevada and California there for a few days at least. Um, and so this was a central low pressure that has since progressed. And now there is a new low pressure that is formed on the lee side of the Rockies. And so you'll see some moisture buildup and progressing across the southern portion, the south central portion of the country. Uh, and then up here, I'm not going to take the time to switch, but we do have high pressure uh, on the north central part of the country, which will actually be descending down over the next couple of days. So you should be expecting some dry, relatively clear conditions if you live up here in the Dakotas and Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, all of that. If you live in that region, you're actually looking at a pretty quiet couple of days. Down here, you might see some pop-up rain showers, especially over here with this remnant low. And then back over here on the northeast, this is where a lot of the action is going to be happening this week. So it's kind of cool that even with satellite images, even without being able to look at a surface map, we can still identify where different pressure systems are across the country. And this is one of the tools that we as meteorologists use pretty heavily when we go through making our forecast products. So let's go ahead and then switch it over to the surface map and we'll go ahead and talk about all the different things that we were just talking about a moment ago. And you can see, look at that. Here's the low pressure here. Here's the secondary one that I highlighted before that has the original comma shape to it. There's the low pressure that has moved across the Rockies over here into Texas. And then here's the high pressure for the north central part of the country. So yeah, satellites, pretty great. Um, so uh, we're really paying a lot of attention to this. So we have these two low pressure systems that will be merging together and producing initially quite a bit of precipitation. So this is right now, this morning, eight o'clock. If we step forward even just a little bit, what you're gonna watch is this low pressure system is gonna move into a region known as the Gulf of Maine. So let me zoom in really close so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. So the Gulf of Maine is a part of the Atlantic that kind of tucks in right underneath the state of Maine itself. It's this little region right here. And why it's important is that it's an incredibly great fuel source for low pressure systems. And so when a low pressure system moves into this region, it now has access to more fuel, more energy, and can actually strengthen, intensify, and become a much bigger low pressure system than it was initially. So what we're going to watch is this low pressure move into the Gulf of Maine and intensify. And you can tell it's intensifying by this number right here, this 982. And if I can zoom in just a little bit closer, that is called the central pressure for the low. So that is at its center point the strongest it is. And so if we measure that in a unit called millibars. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, when we get to the pressure unit of our evaluation on our Monday deep dives. Um, but keep in mind, as this number drops lower and lower, that means the low itself is becoming stronger and stronger. And you could also tell by these contours, these lines, these circles that are going around this low, the more of the lines there are and the tighter, the closer they are together, the stronger the pressure gradient, the stronger, the, the faster the pressure is changing as you go away from the center. And that also contributes to pretty strong winds too. So a couple of things to pay attention to as we go ahead and take a look. So now the low is here in the Gulf of Maine. It's dropped to 973 from 982, just over a six hour period. This is heading into eight o'clock tonight. Um, and now we can see really heavy precipitation tolls, especially across Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, where we're seeing lots of snow. We initially were saying we're starting off as rain. If we step back a little bit, um, 
in this first progression of the low into the region, it is predominantly rain. Uh, but then we see this shift as, as colder temperatures rotate around the backside of the low, that will transition back to snow for most of the northern part of New England and then southern New England is going to see a pretty considerable amount of rain from this system. So now we'll go into the overnight hours. This is 1 o'clock tomorrow morning, getting into 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. You can see the low is now progressing into what we call the Canadian Maritimes. It's moving off to the northeast. Uh, but we are still seeing moisture wrapping around the back side of the system and moving down into New England. So we will see continued snowfall, not as much as like what we're going to see today. So we might see it on the summit at least three to five inches of snow. Uh, and then when we progress into tomorrow, we might see upwards of two to four. So the precipitation will be diminishing across the region, but it will still be predominantly heavy as we get into tomorrow morning. We won't see a heavier amount of diminishing precipitation until we get into Friday evening heading into Saturday. You can see the low is still here, still at 971, still plenty of energy, still plenty of moisture rotating in. Whoop, I jumped a little bit forward. There we go. Oh, I jumped backwards, but we'll go ahead and jump down to the mesoscale. But essentially the point here is that we're looking at um, a lot of moisture coming in with this system. It's going to pick up a lot of coastal air and rotate that back down into New England. So up here, we're going to see plenty of snow. Down in the valleys below, you might see rain this morning, a wintry mix of precipitation transitioning to snow at some point. And across most of the northeast region, if you're down in the southern part at least, expect some pretty heavy rainfall uh, and pretty heavy precipitation totals associated with this low. All right, so now we're coming down to the mesoscale. So this is the next step down. This is the regional look at what's going on. In particular, I want to show you guys what's going on with temperature because I want to talk a little bit about fronts. And I want to spend just a minute or two showing you that low pressure systems have identifiable fronts that you can find in a couple of ways. So each low pressure system, more often than not, has a warm front where we see warmer temperatures moving in and a cold front with colder temperatures moving in. If you can remember that comma-like structure, if we remember that the low is pretty much right here, so here's our central low, Generally speaking, your warm front comes off to the right here, and then your cold front extends off to the bottom left, down here. And so when we have these fronts, these are essentially boundaries between two air masses where temperature is changing across a region. So when you have a warm front, air is moving warmer air into a region of colder air. So you can even see with these little wind bars, if I zoom in here, oh, I realized it was zoomed in on me. You guys couldn't even see what was going on. Uh, so here we go. Here's our picture of the low. Here's our warm front here, and I'll zoom in so you can see the little wind barbs so you get an idea of where the air is moving. So all of these barbs are pointing up here across the red line. This is our warm front. So warmer air is moving from here up into a region of colder air along this boundary. Now the opposite is true for a cold front. So a cold front is when colder air is moving into a region of warmer air. And if we look at the wind barbs over on this side, you'll notice that the air is actually pointing over to the region to the east here, down into this section. And so it's kind of cool. You can even see on the color chart itself, we go from these greens to these light blues, and then we go from these light blues to these greens. These are transitions of temperature as we're moving forward through time. So yeah, so these are frontal systems, and we'll probably talk a bit more about that when we get into one of these deep dives talking about low pressures and all that good stuff. Um, but it is important to pay attention to as we watch how temperature changes as this low moves. So let's go ahead and check that out. How is this going to progress forward in time? So here we go. Here comes the low marching in moving into the Gulf of Maine. We can even see the winds are starting to pick up a little bit. If you guys can see, these barbs have gone from little flags to not like triangle shapes as it rotates in and picks up a ton of moisture and energy. It is pushing some warm air, especially down here into southern New England proper, but we're now we're starting to see colder air rotating in around the back of the system that will be producing snowfall for most of the northern part of New England proper. So now we're moving through into the overnight hours tonight. And this is when we're expecting our wind speeds to ramp up. We are expecting wind speeds in the 50 to 70 mile per hour range with gusts up to 90, maybe even towards the century mark. Um, as we get into tomorrow morning, uh, we will be on the back side of the system. So tons of cold air still rotating in with the moisture coming off of the Atlantic. Um, so this will be the main driver for snow as we get into 8 a.m. tomorrow. So now we see right here in our neck of the woods, we're still seeing really elevated wind speeds. They're even going to go up higher, up to the 65 to 85 with gusts to 110 miles per hour. Um, so this is going to be a pretty impressive system with lots of snow on the beginning end and then colder temperatures and plenty of wind on the back end of it. So we'll be paying a lot of attention to that uh, over the next 48 hours. And then just to show you guys real quick what's going on with precipitation, here's our surface map for precipitation, central low. The greens are our rain uh, with heavier areas of precipitation into the yellows and reds and then we have our snow. So this is right now, so the system is still just moving in, 
And then as we step forward, look how quickly that precipitation develops into much more organized what we call rain bands here. Uh, so heavy rain showers here through southern New England and then lots of snow build up and mixed precipitation and snow in the northern part of New Hampshire where we're located. So this will be for the rest of the day today, getting into the overnight hours tonight. So now you can see most of the main line of rain has moved off over the Atlantic, but all this cold air and moisture is rotating around the back of the system. We're expecting snow showers to continue overnight into tomorrow. So here we are, we got this nice deep blue dot here right where we're located. Um, so you guys can see here in northern New Hampshire, we still got plenty of snow in our forecast for early Friday morning. The system continues to move off to the northeast, but we'll see continued precipitation all the way through the day on Friday. And then we get even another band of snow. It just keeps coming around the backside of the system all the way through the end of the day on Friday. But it's less organized at this point. It is starting to diminish. We are getting snow bands and snow showers and less organized snow by the end of the forecast period headed into Saturday. We'll probably be even getting up into the upslope snow showers. These little patches of snow that form right in our neck of the woods as moisture is lifted up and over the mountains. Uh, and that will carry through into the morning hours on Saturday. So we got a lot of snow in our forecast. We've got lots of precipitation headed our way. Uh, we do have a winter storm warning in effect for here on the summit and then down in the valley below. And I know there is a winter weather advisory, which you might hear coming over the radio right now. Uh, there is a winter weather advisory in effect for our neck of the woods here in New Hampshire, at least, um, for this afternoon, right around two o'clock this afternoon, progressing into Friday morning and even in, maybe even to Friday afternoon, depending on how this situation develops. But if you are looking for more information about the forecast, you can head to mountwashington.org to the higher summits forecast, where Jay, our night observer, went ahead and created this lovely forecast discussion to explain what's going on with the lows, what's going on with precipitation and wind, and you can find out lots of really great information from that. So make sure if you want to know more about the forecast for this part of the country, go ahead and check out our forecast page. And also, don't forget to check out mountwashington.org forward slash classroom. So this is where all of our information for these broadcasts are going to be, including the structure. So we have on Monday, this coming Monday, our next deep dive. And so we'll be taking a look at wind. Um, it's just kind of apropos because this Sunday is the celebration of our big wind day. This is actually the date that we saw the 231 mile per hour wind event. Um, so we'll be talking, we'll be writing a blog post to discuss that event. We'll probably talk heavily about it on Monday. Uh, and just to give you guys a little bit of a tease to look forward to, I want to show you just a little bit of a clip of what some really high winds look like here on the summit. So check this out. Let me zoom over here. He is fully sitting in the wind. See, these are about 100 mile per hour winds. You can even leap and be caught by the wind and blow backwards. And so, we see some really impressively windy conditions here on the summit. We're going to talk about what is wind, how is it developed, essentially, I guess is the word uh, that we're looking for, and why we see the crazy winds that we do here on Mount Washington. So make sure you tune in on Monday, because that's going to be a really interesting talk, and I'm very much looking forward to going over that with you guys. We'll also have a worksheet up for that, so make sure you check out the worksheet. Um, and if you want to go back and watch any of the previous episodes from when Tom was up here this past week, if you happen to miss those, you can find them down below. Uh, you can also find the worksheet for the temperature broadcast on Monday. Lots of really great tools there. And of course, down at the bottom of the page, you can find lots of really great information uh, from other sources. Again, we have all of the pages on mountwashington.org, but we also got NASA Climate Kids, NOAA Climate, lots of really great sources for education, talking about weather and climate and really good stuff. So make sure that you guys check that out for sure. Lots of really great information there. All right, so let's go ahead and get to some questions real quick here. So, if you guys will bear with me while I check out my phone. Let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So Tyler would like to know, what's the largest amount of snow you've gotten in a day to date? And I believe, after I checked with our staff meteorologist, Ryan, after I spoke with him, he said that was 49 inches of snow in one 24-hour period. So that's four feet of snow in one 24-hour period here on the summit, which is a lot. There's not a whole lot of space up here. So that's an incredible amount of snow to see in just a short period of time. Bella would like to know, how long does it take for all the ice and snow to melt? Well, that's a really good question. It kind of depends on a few factors. Um, it needs to be pretty warm up here. It needs to be above freezing more often than not. Um, that's what's initially going to allow the snow and ice to melt out. Uh, but we do get a lot of daytime heating. We get a lot of direct sunlight at this point in the atmosphere. We're pretty exposed to the sun. Um, so when we have a really clear day and the sun is shining right down on the OBS deck and on the tower and on the A-frame, it's usually enough heat to start that melting process. Um, we haven't really had a day like that up here since Tom and Ryan were hit by that major ice storm. So we still have major chunks of ice, 
but hopefully we'll get a couple of clear days here soon so that ice starts to melt. And then that process usually goes all the way up to July. So we usually don't see all of the snow melted off the summit until late June, early July. So yeah, we see snow up here quite often. All right, Donald would like to know about temperature inversions again. Uh, yeah, so basically a temperature inversion is just the opposite of what you would expect as you go up through the atmosphere. So normally when you start from the surface of the Earth and go up through the atmosphere, temperature is decreasing with height. Temperature decreases as you go higher and higher into the sky. But there are some instances, especially when warm air is lifted through the atmosphere, uh, where we have what's called an inversion. The opposite happens where temperature actually increases with height. Now these inversions are very stable layers of air. They kind of act like a lid. And if that lid sits right over top of Mount Washington, we can see some really impressive wind speeds up here. So yeah, inversions are really cool. And you can even sometimes see them out on the horizon. They're kind of like a little shadow against the horizon sky. So yeah, very good question indeed. Uh, let's see, Evan would like to know, how do you get your meals while you're working at the station? We cook them. Uh, so our summit operations manager, manager, Becca, actually goes out and does the grocery shopping for us and then sends the groceries up each week. And then we are all responsible for cooking our own meals. Now, since I'm alone here on days, I cook my own breakfast and lunch. And then we kind of rotate between the observers, between myself and Jay and David, uh, rotating the responsibility of prepping meals at night. So yeah, we cook our own food, which is pretty cool. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit. Oh, there we go. Okay. Julia would like to know what's the worst storm that I've seen this year. So 2019, 2020. Um, that would probably have to be the one where we hit 142 miles per hour and it was heavy icing. Um, so basically we were seeing five inches of ice growth per hour. Uh, and it basically we have to keep running up and down the stairs to the top of the tower to de-ice the instruments to knock all that ice off and try to stand on top of the tower and knock that ice off without getting blown over by 140 mile per hour wind. So yeah, I, I would say that's probably the worst storm that I've seen so far this year. Mm -mm -mm. So, Joshua would like to know about occluded fronts. So I don't have a whole lot of time to talk about occluded fronts, but what I can tell you is that an occluded front is basically the merging of a warm front and a cold front. So when you have that low pressure system, when you have the warm front off the side and the cold front coming off the bottom there, uh, what happens is the cold front eventually catches up to the warm front and the two start to merge. Uh, usually when you see that happening, it means the low pressure is reaching the strongest point of its life cycle before it starts to decay and dissipate. So if you're looking at a surface map and you see a purple line, um, that is marking an occluded front. So yeah, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that a bit more, but that is a very good question. Excellent job. Uh, all right, I'll take one more because we're just about out of time here. Avery would like to know, when is the latest in summer you have seen snow? So I've seen snowfall the first week of July. So I think it was July 3rd or July 4th. And then the longest that I've seen a patch of snow up here on the summit was like July 10th, I believe. And it wasn't here directly on the summit. It was actually over on Mount Jefferson in what we call the Jefferson snow patch. It's this really deep snow field that builds up over the winter and is usually the last thing to melt out as we get into the summer months. So yeah, that was probably the longest I've seen. But I mean, it's so hard to imagine being in a place uh, relatively similar to like most of New England in the Midwest where you see normal temperatures throughout the year but you can still see snow in the first week of July, 4th of July week, uh, where you can see snow fall on the summit. It's pretty crazy. So you guys, great questions. Thank you so much for being so engaging today. I will try to go back and answer any questions I didn't get to in chat. Um, you can always direct message us on any of our social media uh, platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You can send us an email and I promise I'll try to get to those questions as fast as I can today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you guys are here on Monday for our deep dive connection where we talk about wind. It's going to be super exciting when we go back and look at the 231 mile per hour wind event that we saw up here. It's going to be a great time. So we really appreciate you guys connecting in with us. Hopefully you enjoyed today's talk and hopefully we'll see you on Monday as well. So thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day.